Hello, everyone. I am Katie Cullen. I'm a tenured professor in the Department of Psychiatry, and I'm also the, D the director for the Division of Child and Adolescent Mental Health in the medical school here at the University of Minnesota. Welcome to the first session of the mini medical school Mind Matters, Brain and Mental Health. We are so excited to have you here today, and we look forward to guiding you through our first topic, which is decoding the brain. So we're going to begin with a moderated discussion followed by a question and answer session. So you can so please submit your questions to our panelists um, at any time using the Q and A box, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. There's a um, there will be a Q and A button there. Um, and please note that this session is being recorded. Um, and so it will be available, the recording will be available starting tomorrow at the Office of Academic Affairs um, YouTube channel. And we'll share the link with you by email. Um, so today we have the privilege of speaking with a panel of experts on the latest research on the basic structure and function of the brain in earliest stages of development. Um, so I would next like to introduce our panelists. I'll first bring in Dr. Damien Fair. Dr. Fair is the Redleaf Endowed Director for the Masonic Institute for the Developing Brain. He's a cognitive neuroscientist and a 2020 MacArthur Fellow. His research focuses on the mechanisms and principles that underlie the developing brain. Combining technical advances in functional, magnetic resonance imaging, advanced mathematical techniques, and expertise in psychology and neuroscience, Dr. Fair investigates resting state brain connectivity. He has been able to more precisely observe how distinct regions in the brain communicate with each other and how this communication evolves at different stages of development from infancy to adolescence. Dr. Fair, can you please give us an overview of the structure and function of the brain and new ways that scientists are exploring brain function? All right, well, thank you for that introduction and, and I'm very much, very much glad to be here. I will, I will definitely give you some insights into some basic understanding of, of brain and how it's, how it's organized and some aspects of how we study it today. So I have no, and I have no disclosures for this particular um, program or presentation. Okay, so now we know that now one in six children now have a developmental disability, and that's a that's a seventeen percent increase over the last decade, driven in large part by several mental health disorders that I study, ADHD and autism. Um, major depressive disorder affects about fifteen percent of the global population, adult population, at some point in their lifetime. Um, twenty percent of adolescents have now thought about committing suicide. That's one in five. That's um, and that was even before the pandemic. It's becoming one of the more debilitating um, health conditions in the world. Um, and if you think about adolescents, um, about 41.5% of high school students drive or text or email while, you know, while they're driving. 32 um, or close to 33% drink alcohol while driving. 20% use um, marijuana. And through all this, one of the things that I try to ask is what is going on inside their brain. And now we have various types of new non-invasive tools with brain imaging that's providing us uh, a lot of information about how the brain is organized and what types of patterns of brain activity relate to complex behaviors. And then also how these tools are now allowing us to personalize different types of, of therapeutics. So I get to talk about that today. So one of the, I would say, new advancements in the world of fMRI and non-invasive neuroimaging related to these topics um, it's called resting state fMRI. Now, most people know or understand or heard of in the past uh, fMRI, where you put someone in a, in a scanner and you have them do some type of task that's interleaved by some type of control task. So you'll have them go in the scanner and they'll open their eyes and then they'll close their eyes and they'll open their eyes and then they'll close their eyes and they'll open their eyes and they'll close their eyes over and over and over again until at some point, um, a part of the brain that you can average across those those activity and you can identify the part of the brain that's active when your eyes are 
open to when you're closed, in this case, looking at part of the visual cortex in the brain. Well, back in 1995, well, some people ask, well, you know, well, why why is it that you have to do so many so many trials in order to see that activity? And it's because the in, the data in that in those in the MRI scanner is actually quite noisy, just like the noisy polls you get for a uh, an election, right? Well, back in 1995, a guy by the name of Brad Biswal decided to look a lot more closely at this noise that we have in the fMRI signal. And what he did is he had someone go in the scanner and do a similar type of task that I just described, except it would be finger tapping and then rest and finger tapping and then rest and finger tapping and rest. You average across all those different types of signals. And lo and behold, if you take one of those parts of the brain regions that are active when you're finger tapping versus not, and you just have people go back in the scanner and this time don't do anything at all. You just rest and just, just rest and don't do any types of movements. You take one of those parts of one of those brain regions and you correlate that with the rest of the brain. And lo and behold, the same parts of the brain that are that are active when you're actually doing the task are spontaneously oscillating with each other where you're at rest, not doing anything at all. This is what we call functional connectivity MRI. It shows that this signal is not noise at all, but it's actually telling us something about how the brain is actually organized. Um, and has been as you'll see, has provided us a lot of fodder about how we can leverage this to understand brain development and, and, and leverage it in certain types of health conditions. Now, the brain is extremely complicated. We have billions and billions and billions of neurons you know, that are in the brain that are accompanied by over 200 trillion different types of connections. That's just one brain. So you can, you can imagine when you're as scientists are trying to understand how this brain is how the brain is organized it can be very difficult so we have to figure out how to condense that information into something that we can that we can understand a little bit better and one way that we do that is using the concept that's called graph theory which i'll just well which i'll describe in a second so everybody take out your pen and pad we're going to do a little bit of math here okay so what is what is the network what is a brain network well the network in its simplest form um, it's just a collection of nodes. So nodes can be anything from people to places to like web pages, in our case, brain regions that are connected by some line or edge. So that would then be friends between people, um, links between web pages, roads between cities, or in this case, connectivity between, um, between different parts of the brain regions. Now we've been able to use this type of concept, what we call graph theory, in all different types of systems, from networks on the internet to U.S. commuting patterns to interactions of committees and subcommittees in Congress, assuming that everything is working properly, of course, <laughs> to protein-protein um, interactions in yeast. And what you can see from all these systems, right, is that they're not they're not regular. It's not simply A connects to B, connects to C, connects to D, um, but they're also not random. There's clearly some type of structure that exists inside here. And so what we try to do with graph is how do we quantify these particular patterns? And then what do they mean with regard to the nature of how the system is actually working? Um, so in our case, again, our nodes are brain regions and the connections between them can be this Con con this non-invasive spontaneous activity that we have um, um, in the brain where we can generate some of these measures. Now, there are some things that are very simple, right? So like you have some parts of the brain that are highly connected, means they have lots of, um, they have lots of connections or high degree. There's some brain regions that have very few connections and they have means they have very few, very, they have a low degree. There are other measurements like path length. So if I want to get information from one part of the brain to another part of the brain. I might have to take, make, have to make a bunch of leaps. In fact, these are the types of things that describe things you've heard about in the past in our, in the pop culture, like six degrees of Kevin Bacon or six degrees of separation. But there are also some, some other, other measurements that we use, and that is things like what we call modules or clusters or communities where we try to identify essentially communities of parts of the brain or systems that are more highly connected relative to other systems in the brain. Um, and this is just showing some, some what these we call these types of edges. Now, from this techniques, we've, we've discovered some many fundamental properties of how the brain is organized. Um, 
um, how the brain organizes in, in various ways. So for example, we've learned that the brain is made up of a relatively small number of networks about, you know, somewhere between 10 to 17 systems that, that connect all these different types of the brain. Some of them now, nowadays are scientists to a lot of, you know, like to take these for granted in all of our work, but they're really not that old, only over a decade or so old since we even made these types of discoveries. We know that the changes in these systems are really important for development um, and how, and how, um, and how our brain functions. Now, when we're studying mental health disorders or we're trying to think through um, complex issues and using these techniques to study mental health or adolescence or um, brain development, um, it can be hard because there's some other issues that we have to deal with. Um, and some of them you must, and everybody recognizes from some their every everyday lives. So for example, we know one goal when we're examining these kind of complex behaviors with these techniques or brain physiology in our youth is to determine whether the information directly associates with our developmental trajectories or some health issue that happens now or later, later in life. In other words, we're asking ourselves, can brain imaging, can our behavioral assessments help us in understanding and predicting something that might happen in the future, or can it help us tailor some early intervention? Now, typically when we start this, we started off by doing something like this, where we take a group of, of participants that defined in some way, we take another group defined in another way, we compare them to try to figure out how they may be different. So for example, you might take a group of kids that are been um, diagnosed with ADHD or control kids, and we, we try to compare, or a kid versus an adult, and we try to compare. Now, there's a few issues with this. One is that it relies on the assumption that our, that when I when I have diagnosed someone with ADHD, that it represents like a, a one homogeneous group. Um, it may be the case that there may be lots of different ways that um, the brain may be different or unique in individuals that may lead to some um, disorder like ADHD. Um, but it also assumes that our typically developing populations are also one big group, right? And we also know from our everyday lives that kids in general are highly different in, in very different ways. And so there's lots of variability, what we call heterogeneity that exists in our population that we have to, we have to solve. Um, now in the case of ADHD, but really in many other mental health disorders, there's lots of ideas about how, um, lots of ideas in publications and papers about that this idea of heterogeneity or differences between our populations must be true. But to understand that in the case of um, in the case of um, how you rec how you relate this to the brain, it can be very hard because because mathematically demonstrating where these groups lie is not very straightforward. I mean, and this is this is why. So if you go into a study like the ones I do in my lab, and you have ten or ten or so people in it, the number of different ways you can partition even just ten people is about twenty one thousand different ways. As soon as you have twenty people in a study or in your in your in your in your cohort, there's over over trillions of different ways that you can do that. So it's very very complicated. Um, now, what we use have been working on has been using graph theory and some other techniques to be able to to solve this. And I'm just going to give you one example. So in this case, instead of using something like brain regions as our nodes and this connectivity measures our edges, now we're going to use people as our nodes and our and some type of behavior as our edges. And I get to show you just an example of some of the data that's come out of some of this work that is 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 really important for how we think about mental health disorders um, like ADHD. So this is looks like a complicated picture, but um, this is all we're looking at is a bunch of different types of behaviors across, but you typically see a typical in ADHD from memory to um, how how variable your responses are. And in this picture, what we're showing is this grouping of the individual participants with ADHD. And what we can see on this slide here, I'm just gonna just gonna describe it really quickly, is that different kids with, with ADHD, the diagnosed with ADHD have typically have um, are atypical from their peers in different ways. In some ways they're atypical in, in their responses, other ways in their what we call executive functions or memory, arousal and other other things. 
But what we also can see is even in those cases, in our just our typically developing kids, these are kids without ADHD, um, they can be broken up into the same unique types of categories. So that even so we have variability in our typically developing population, we have variability in our ADHD population. And sometimes the only way to really understand, I'm just gonna do this quick to make sure we have time, to make really understand um, who's who is if we begin to look and, and compare kids in their unique um, their u unique profiles based on these based on their own individual communities. So what we can see what the data what the data is showing us for how we think about this both in childhood and adolescence is that there's lots of variation observed in our all populations. Um, and that we need to understand what that variation looks like to really understand um, these types of disorders, both in the brain and the behavior. Now, when I was showing you these stuff, showing you some of this work earlier, one of the things that up until about five to seven years ago, almost all the data we ever looked at in this realm was based on group averaging. So where you take a, a, an MRI from an individual you take another individual, you do that a hundred times, you average all the data together. And then it's telling us a lot of principles like the ones I told you earlier, where we have in the brain, you have about somewhere between 10 to 10 to 17 networks that, ex that exist um, that relate to various types of complex behaviors. The problem with this model that we're learning um, is that nobody's average, right? And so I'm from Minnesota, so I do a little bit of jokes on my, my friends from Wisconsin. But nobody's average. Everybody's different in some specific way. And that really matters for how we use these techniques to for, um, for different types of future therapeutics. And I'll show you why in a second. Now, about eight years ago, one of my colleagues, his name is Russ Poldrack, he's kind of a mad scientist, and he put himself in the MRI scanner twice a day or twice a week for 10 months straight. He gathered almost 14 hours of data on himself. And what he was able to show by, with using this kind of data, if we collect a lot of it, is that there's a lot, even though the general pattern of what you see in the population is true in the brain, everybody has their own fingerprint of what their brain systems look like. They're very, very, very unique from person to person to person to person. And that variability turns out really matters for how we might leverage these types of information for um, new types of treatments. This is just a picture of the type of variability across what's called the ABACD study. It's a, this is just 200 participants, just look, just kind of giving you a sense of how much variation, despite some of the same pictures exist in every individual brain. Okay. Now, the, 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 the good news is that because we've gotten really, really good at the, um, we've gotten really, really good at the ability to measure these types of data, um, we can do very cool things with it. So, for example, this is a this this is an adolescent um, who, on the left hand, who was the starting pitcher on his baseball team. He went into the clinic because he had some difficulties with um, he had some small he had some difficulties with some new headaches, and what was discovered is that he ended up having a very large what's called perinatal stroke, I and mean, it happens in about one in one hundred births. Um, where right at the time of birth, because of small um, some drops in, in, in pressure and can be some class, you can have a, a stroke. But the, the neonatal brain is so plastic that he grew up his whole life without ever even knowing it. And the brain was organized in a very unique way to support his typical functions. As you can see here, the black parts here are, the, are these actual lesions. But because we're able to collect these data in a, in, in a way that's very unique, we can see exactly how his brain compensated over the course of his development that allowed him to be the starting pitcher in this high school baseball team, um, all from using these kind of non-invasive imaging techniques. Here's another picture of an intervention. These are three individuals who were, had their arms casted for very specific amounts of times. And we can now, with these new imaging techniques, see exactly how the brain changes as a function of having your arm casted for a long time. Now, this, of course, doesn't cause any deficits or anything, but it tells you a little bit, even in adulthood, even in adolescents, your brain is constantly changing um, and constantly um, um, and constantly responding to new environmental changes, including like 
your your arm being cast. Um, in this case, um, there's some interesting things in here, but we'll keep moving on. Now, this kind of personalized mapping in the brain is also important for other things too. So one of them is for now, we have new techniques where we can modulate parts of the brain that allow us to use as treatment instead of drugs for mental health disorders like depression. And what we're learning is that by using our own individual fingerprint of the brain, that we can position this type of neuromodulation in a way that improves um, how these treatments actually, actually work. And here's just two cases of new papers that are kind of cutting edge things that we're able to do now with these imaging techniques to maximize treatment outcomes. Um, so to include here, MRI and functional MRI are showing us how the brain is organized in many ways. Um, it's highlight highlighting how the brain matures over time in both typical and atypical populations. Um, it's showing us how what's the most important in many respects is how we're all different um, in our brains. And then it, that allows us to guide new therapies that are beginning to reach patients, patients even today. Um, and I'm just going to end with showing that um, these types of techniques and understanding brain or organization is now kind of blowing up in the world. Um, we at the University of Minnesota are now um, leading efforts for following brain development from the earliest periods of life, This in this period, even during pregnancy, all the way through when childhood, nine or 10, um, scanning 9,000 you know, mother-infant dyads over the course of, of, of 10 years, and then carrying that on through adolescence and what's called the Adolescent Brain and Child Development Study, where there's now 12,000 different um, 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 adolescents that are following from nine to 10 to 21 years old using these same types of techniques. So the, the future is bright, the data is there, and it's, a, it's an exciting time to do this type of work. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end there and just, I want to say, of course, a lot of the things that I talked about today is not just me. There's lots of collaborators for our, this work that exists across the world, really, um, and in, including here in Minnesota and in our, in our labs. And I want to thank all of them. And I'll, I'll end there and, and turn it over. Great. Thank you so much, Damien. That was actually so fantastic to hear. Um, I'm very familiar with your work, but I um, I really thought that was a wonderful um, way to present it. Um, thank you. Um, and now I'm very excited to introduce Megan Swanson, um, our next speaker. Dr. Swanson is an associate professor of pediatrics and a developmental and cognitive neuroscientist. She, her research in her, in her research, she investigates the neurobiology of early communication, and she's also interested in how infants and their parents communicate and how this early communication supports brain development and later language and cognitive skills. Dr. Swanson, could you please discuss the first 1000 days of brain development and why that period is so crucial? Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you for the invitation to take part in this mini medical series. It really is an honor to be kicking off the 25th year of this event. Um, just before we get started, um, I do not have any conflicts of interest. The opinions and views are mine and mine alone. And I also acknowledge that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. My goal today is uh, threefold. So first, I'm gonna spend some time giving a general overview of early brain development. Then I'm gonna describe brain plasticity. And last, I'm gonna use language as an example of how the brain is shaped in early development. So the image that I'm showing you here is of a neonate brain. So this is a very little baby who is scanned. And this is data collected from an MRI machine, um, magnetic resonance imaging. And the, this is a T1 acquisition, which is a type of structural scan. So we're gonna use this to start our journey into how the infant brain is built. And to give you a little bit of orientation, these images are such that we're looking top down on the brain. So I've labeled here about where the eyes would be in the back of the head. Now, if I put up the next slide, this is um, an image from a one-year-old. And I think the first thing that you'll notice is that just the sheer difference in size. So the brain really does undergo this massive development um, in volume over the first year of life. And you'll probably also notice that the image looks a little bit different. And it looks a little bit different because of what's happening at um, the level of the cell. 
Um, I'm not a cellular neuroscientist, so I promise I'll keep this brief. But um, what I will note is that the picture here is of a neuron. And neurons have cell bodies and dendrites, and they also have axons that are sometimes myelinated. And in these images that you're seeing here, the white parts would reflect um, axons that have been myelinated, and the gray parts are mostly these dendrites and cell bodies, but um, other stuff as well. And if I put up the slides going up until year six, what you'll notice is that, yeah, the brain continues to grow. It gets a little bit bigger, but what it also does, it becomes more differentiated. So the sharpness between these white spots and the gray spots become more pronounced. And what that is reflecting is that the brain is undergoing this process of these axons becoming myelinated. And that's what we refer to as uh, white matter. So um, it, total brain volume in babies, so two to four, two to four weeks old is about 36% of the adult volume. But by two years of age, it's actually 83% of the adult volume. And every single time I say that stat, it um, just is, uh, it, it kind of astonishes me. And having a three-year-old myself, um, and many of you have noticed when you look at kids, their heads are sized out proportionately to their bodies. And that is indeed the case because they are going through this rapid brain development in the first few years of life. So these images show us first just the enormous growth in brain size over the first two years, but they also show us this process of refinement and brain development where white matter becomes more pronounced. So I mentioned that we collect these images using MRI brain scans. Um, and for anyone that's undergone an MRI scan, they know that, that it's very loud and that you have to lie very still. And it turns out that these are two things that babies and toddlers are, um, they either don't like or they're pretty terrible at. So you might be wondering how in the world do you all get these brain scans on these little babies and toddlers? And it turns out that we do it by um, utilizing a technique where we scan them while they're sleeping. Um, and it looks a little bit like this. So for most of these studies, the babies come into the lab and participate in a long battery of assessments that usually gets them pretty tired. So then we shuttle them off to the scanner. And when it's a little bit past their bedtime, we have um, their caregivers help get them to sleep. We also have um, staff that are specially trained to assist in this step. And then once the babies are sleeping, we use multiple layers of ear protection to protect their small ears. Um, and then we lay them on the scanner table and put the coil over their head. Um, then we slide the table into the scanner, which is the, the, the bore, which is kind of that donut looking part in this um, image. And that's usually the point in time when everyone in the room holds their breath and crosses their fingers as we start the actual MRI brain scan and just hope that they fall asleep. Uh, we actually have a pretty high success rate using this technique, around 85%. Sometimes babies wake up and we pull them out and then get them back to sleep and put them back in. But it really has um, this technique of scanning during natural sleep has opened up this entire area of investigation into understanding how brains are built. So like I said, here's our image again of um, our neurons and we have gray matter, which is mostly comprised of dendrites and cell bodies. And I'm showing here what this development looks like from birth to 80 years of age. And this is from a study that was published a couple of years ago and is really a remarkable study because it takes data from a bunch of different sources and puts it all into one analysis so we can map what this development looks like. So in this figure, the vertical axis is volume. Um, and then the horizontal figure is age, starting at before birth and then going until, as I said, 80 years of age. And what um, the, the colors here represent um, boys and girls. And what I think you can um, tell here is that during this first two years of life, this line is really steep. So we're seeing just really rapid development. And this increase in gray matter volume starts mid gestation and it peaks at around six years of age. And after six years of age, we see a pretty um, steady decrease but it's actually growing the fastest when infants are five months old. So that's the point when we're seeing the fastest um, growth in terms of volume at five months of age. 
So that was gray matter. And then the, the brain is also composed of white matter. And those are the parts of the, the axon that is myelinated. And I like to think of white matter as the brain's freeway system. It allows for rapid communication across the brain. Uh, the brain doesn't start off highly myelinated. That's a process that takes uh, decades <laughs> to accomplish. And um, if we um, put this next slide up here, we can see uh, white matter volume on here as well. So again, we're also looking at a part of neurons here, but this is this um, axon, myelinated axon. It's a fatty substance, so um, that's why it shows up white on those scans. And the pattern is definitely a little bit different here, as you can see. So again, the vertical axis is volume, and then the horizontal axis is age. And um, what you see here is that, again, we have um, volume in white matter increasing rapidly from mid-gestation into early childhood, but it actually doesn't peak until 28 years of age. And then around 50, there begins an accelerated decline. So it's a much longer ramp up for white matter development and then um, a much faster decline. And white matter growth is actually the fastest when children are 2.5 years of age. So that is quite a bit different from gray matter development. So overall, during the first thousand days of life, the brain undergoes rapid, massive development, which is then followed by a period of refinement that does continue into 20s and 30s and beyond. Um, the, the, this pattern of development um, is different across the brain. And I just want to show you one more picture of brains here before we get to some pictures of babies to illustrate this point. So again, we're using, this is actually what we would call the axial view. So we're looking top down on the brain. So I've oriented you to where the eyes and the back of the head are. And this is a, a scan technique that's designed to um, highlight white matter. So those um, myelinated axons in the picture that I showed you previously. And these slides depict white matter development from three months into to three years of age or 36 months. And what I think is depicted in this is the three months look pretty dark. There is not a lot of white matter um, in the three month old brain, but there is some. Um, and then that increases throughout the first three, three years of life. And it turns out that white matter development rolls out in a pretty particular, particular pattern. So projection tracks, these are tracks like the cortical spinal track um, that connect um, the rest of our nervous system with the cortex. They're largely responsible for sensory and motor functions. Um, and they're uh, the most myelinated at birth, but then they're actually the slowest to mature after that. And it makes sense that this fiber, these fiber tracks are the earliest to mature because as I said, they're responsible for basic motor functions and sensory. The corpus callosum, which is a fiber track that connects our right and left hemisphere, hemisphere, it's less myelinated at birth, but then it undergoes fast development in the first two years of life. Um, and there are also fiber tracks that play major roles in social aspects of our lives, like language and communication. And these fiber tracks are actually the last to develop. Um, and they also start off uh, fairly unmyelinated and then kind of have a long march to being fully set up and um, myelinated. So I've told you now about the basics of brain development, but I want to put this into context so we can see what it looks like in terms of a behavior that many of us have seen us unfold in the children that we spend time with. Um, so I'm gonna use the language as an example here. Um, and the journey towards language learning is one that doesn't start with the first word, but rather it starts in the first months of life. I'm gonna show you um, videos here. I'm hoping that the audio will work. If it doesn't, um, someone should um, holler at me. And these are videos of my um, daughter when she was a baby, she is now three. Let's take a peek here.
So in this video, <laughs> clearly not talking, but she's beginning to play around with vocalization. She's making those little trilling sounds, playing with the toy overhead, and then finishes this clip with just a really um, sweet social smile. So already engaging with the people around her at four months of age. Now, if we zoom to 12 months of age, so just around the first year, this is often the time when babies say their first word. Let's see what her language looks like now. <laughs> so in this video is still a lot of exploration with her voice um it's hard to catch but she actually does say her um what was her first word, which is Luna, the name of our dog. She looks down. Luna was probably at her feet hoping she dropped some snacks. And she said Luna in the mix of that. But what you hear mostly is a lot of babbling. And then not four months later, so just, you know, at, at 16 months, it's a totally different ball game. Do you want to count? One, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine ten. Good job. You're so smart. So at 16 months now, she can count to 10. Um, she also has a few more words that she can say. And she's also, you know, laughing, using a lot of social cues. Um, by the time that children are two, many toddlers use two to four word sentences and say up to 500 words. She's, as I said, almost three will be turning three in just a few weeks. And now she um, speaks in sentences. She can tell us about her dreams. She tells us stories, even though they're not super complicated. Um, and she has no problem expressing her wants and desires using language. So this remarkable feat is called the language explosion. And um, it turns out that it's possible due to brain development. So brain development um, during the first few years of life is remarkable, oops, here we go, um, is remarkable, not just in terms of the sheer volume of development that we see, but also due to neuroplasticity. So neuroplasticity is the ability for neurons to change in form and function in response to the environment. And the, the image that I'm showing you here is meant to reflect this relationship between how easy the brain can change in response to experiences and, um, or sorry, rather the brain's ability to change in response to experiences and how much effort is required to enact that change. And what this is meant to depict is that early in development in the first three years of life, the brain is highly plastic. It can change pretty easily in response to um, experiences in response to the environment. And later in life, it takes much more effort to enact the same sort of change in the brain. And for any of you out there who have tried to learn a second language as an adult, as an adult, this will track with you because it is incredibly difficult to learn um, a new language as an adult. Um, we just simply cannot learn language at the rate that toddlers can <laughs> and young children can. So the brain in the first three years of life is unique um, in, in it, a large part due to this high, this period of high neural plasticity. So what does that mean? Um, well, it means that brains are built one day at a time. Um, there is certainly is a genetic component to brain development, as uh, Damien illustrated in, in his um, talk. You know, there's sort of the basics of what a brain should look like while it's being um, built, but it's really our experiences that shape the architecture of the brain. And we know now that positive interactions with caregivers helps to build a strong foundation for brain development. So I like to use the analogy of a house for this. 
So a house lasts a long time. It has, um, if it has a sturdy foundation. So likewise, our brains need a sturdy foundation and we can build that through positive interactions with caregivers and caregivers can yes, be parents can also be other family members that the children spend time with. It can be um, childcare workers, family, friends, really anybody. So in this way, caregivers have an, an incredible opportunity to be change agents in their children's lives. I'm particularly interested in understanding how caregiver speech supports language development. So I wanted to share a little bit of data um, in that area of research. So 30 years of research have now shown us that babies and toddlers who hear the most caregiver speech go on to have the best language skills. Um, studies have found this pattern in children who speak English, children who speak Spanish, children who come from high-income homes and low-income homes. I've done this research and shown that this pattern holds true in infants that develop autism. It's also been shown in children with brain in injury. So far, the finding appears to be pretty universal. So this is data um, that I'm, I'm showing you here from a paper I published a few years ago. This is actually a study that included a sample of kids with autism. So I don't want you to pay attention to the colors of the dots or the lines. Um, the black, the solid black um, bold line is the one that's important here. So what this graph is showing you on the vertical axis is toddler language skills. Um, and then on the horizontal axis is the number of adult words that are spoken to that infant. And what this figure is showing you is that infants who hear the most caregiver speech go on to be the same infants that have the best language skills. And we collect this data using these Lena recorders. Um, it, it's what um, this small child who you saw videos of previously is holding in this picture. And these Lena recorders allow us to collect 16 hours of recording and capture really the everyday lives of infants and toddlers. We can then use automated algorithms to generate counts for things like how many words are spoken to or near the infant during the day. And this technology um, has really opened up this um, whole new world of um, studies in understanding how caregiver speech helps to shape child development. So this is a talk about the brain. So I'm going to um, end by sharing you some new findings in the field um, that ties this story together. So Rachel Romeo is a, a talented assistant professor who has done a series of studies um, on SES diver diverse four and six-year-old children. And what she was able to show is that the children in this study both collected this home language recording data using these Lena recorders, and then she put these children in an MRI scanner. And what she found was that the amount of caregiver speech these, um, these four to six-year-olds heard was related to features that she saw in the brain. So she saw this both from um, a, a using functional approaches like um, Damien shared with us in the left inferior frontal gyrus, which is sort of that yellow region um, in the figure. And then also looking at white matter, um, she found similar associations with the left arcuate fasciculus. And both of these structures are um, brain regions that we know are very important for language in adults. So in the adult literature, when people have brain injury in these regions, frequently language is interrupted. So we know that these regions are important for um, language. Research in my own lab has um, looked at similar associations, but in infants. So um, we have two different studies, one looking at um, the structural development of the brain and another one looking at white matter. And what we found is that the 15 month old infants, uh, so how much caregiver speech 15 month, 15 -month old infants heard was related to both structural brain development and the left angular gyrus and also white matter development in the left arcuate fasciculus. Um, I already told you that the left arcuate is important for language development. The left angular gyrus is another one of those regions that we know is important to support language in, um, in children. 
This research is um, really in its infancy, for lack of a better term. Um, it's really only been probably the last 15 years when the field has developed techniques for collecting data on infants using this natural sleep approach. Previously, the only way to collect this data was using sedation, which is suboptimal for a number of reasons. So, um, you know, there's still a lot to learn about brain development in the first 1,000 days, but um, it's an incredible privilege to be a part of this field and to be um, learning new things every day. So with that, um, I just want to take a second to thank the families who have participated in our studies. They put a tremendous amount of trust and faith in us that we can get their babies to sleep and we can put them in this loud magnet and everything's going to be okay. And they also trust us to collect this information in their homes. And, and that is something that I um, am thankful for every day. And the National Institutes of Health has funded my research for a number of years. So I'm grateful for that as well. And with that, I will stop sharing and pass it back. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Megan. That was really, really informative. I learned a lot. Um, so um, now this is um, going to be um, really fun. We are going to move on to questions submitted by our attendees. And we've already had many really, really great um, questions that have been submitted. So thank you to our audience for your thinking and your um, contribution to these conversations. And as a reminder, you can submit your questions to our panelists using the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So I will lead with the first um, question. And this one is for Damien. Um, could you please just talk about the basic functions of the left and right sides of the brain? Oh, that's a, that's a very good one. Um, so that is it's it's always an ongoing debate, but there are a few there are a few things that we we do know fairly well about the left and right side of the brain. So pretty so a lot of times um, we have asymmetries in where our language, for example, is is um, encoded. So typically, if you're right-handed, you know your language is encoded in the left side of the brain. Sometimes it can be encoded in the right side of the brain. And if you're left-handed, it's a little bit more 50-50. Um, there are things like different types of attention that are coded in different in sides of the brain. So for example, if I was to show you the letter A, but drawn out with a bunch of small letter Bs, right? One side of the brain, the right side will focus on the big A, and the left side will focus on the small Bs, you know? We know a lot of this about the, we know a lot about this, about the, how the, the, like attention's organized in part because of um, lesions in the, in the brain from like strokes. So for example, um, if you have a, a stroke in a, a very specific part of the brain in the right hemisphere, um, you'll have what's called, ne what's called uh, um, neglect, where you won't be able to, you, you'll be able to see, but you won't be able to tend to one side of the brain. If you look up on the internet, you'll probably see stuff of people shaving half their face or um, or things like that. So there's there's lots of interesting parts of, of this. And you got me just swirling a little bit because we don't necessarily, when you get these, when I, I was describing how there's these complex systems in the brain, that there's lots of connections and everything. And we tend to think that the functions exist at the place where you get these lesions and then and then that's what that must be in in and in, uh, must be there, but the brain's almost like a city where um, I could have a car crash on one of the main freeways, right? And that may cause dysfunction in the traffic that could be in a small street in a very different part part of the way, right? So some of these functions which we can we can elicit left and right, we don't necessarily think they exist in there, but it's like causing the whole system to change. That has that shows these types of asymmetries. So anyway, I'll stop there. And but well, those are a few examples. Thank you. That is really helpful. Megan, did you have anything to add? I have another question for you too. <laughs> Nothing to add. Okay. So Megan, this is for you. Could you please speak to um, nature versus nurture in early brain development? Yes. What a good question. Um, so um, I told you that, you know, caregivers have the potential to be change agents and um, that's the truth, um, they, they can. 
but you know how much you talk to your kid does not have the capability to rewire brain development right so i think nature and nurture um go hand in hand i like to think of it as um nurture so the way that parents interact with their kids can help support optimal development for that child, right? So it doesn't matter how much I want my own kids to be as smart as Einstein and to have an IQ off the charts, right? I can talk to them as much as I possibly can. And what I can do is support their own potential, um, but we can't kind of override um, our genetics or you know nature in that way. Right. Thank you. Um, Damien, are you seeing new opportunities for your, for treatment in adolescent ADHD through your research? We are. Um, I, and I think the, in, in ADHD research, I, the, I think the recognition, right. That, that every child that presents with these, with, um, the types of symptoms is different is leading to for clinicians, um, like Katie here to think about think more critically about how we go about you know treating with our current our current therapies, but then also um, also new alternative therapies that are more coming that are coming online. Now I often like to think about this in terms of in my previous life I was a physician assistant and I did a lot of stroke research or not research but practice clinical practice, and when 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 somebody comes in the emergency room. When they have difficulty um, speaking, they might have a facial droop on one side of their body. They might have difficulty moving one side of their the, the motor movement on one side of their body. You you know as a clinician that they had a you had a stroke. Um, now, and that's because of the symptoms that you can see, right? But you don't start treating them right away. And the reason why is because you, you typically put them in a CT scanner. Nowadays, sometimes they put them in an MRI scanner. Because you need to know whether that's an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke. One's from a clot and the other one's from a bleed. And they present, the symptoms can be identical, but what's causing those that those symptoms can be completely different. And you can imagine things like aspirin that we use for secondary prevention of stroke would never come online if we, we gave everybody that came in with those symptoms those those drugs, right? So part of, you know, part of our um, um, growth here, it seems like some other sounds here, but part of our growth here dealing is kind of recognizing that. We aim to empower. Thank you. Um, great. And Megan, I have a question for you. Um, do you see any so effect of social economic status on infant brain development? Oh, that is a really good question. Um, there's been a little bit of research on the topic. Um, it is really hard to disentangle that, right? So what we do know and has been replicated in a number of studies is that as a group, high-income parents talk more to their kids to low-income parents. We also know that hearing more caregiver speech leads to better language skills. So we see this pattern unfolding where high-income parents talk more to their kids, their kids go on to have better language skills. Now you might think that then like income is what's driving this association and that's not actually the case. Um, it's much more complicated than that. Um, there, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just like taxing my brain of studies that I've um, read in the last few years. There's at least one study I know of like older kids and looking at SES differences. Um, and I don't trust myself to, to, to give you the results, but I'm wondering if Damien has read those studies and can chime in here. Yeah, I, I can chime in. Um, it turns out that, and there are some from very, so at the very end of my talk, I gave you, I, I kind of was highlighting some of the the um, opportunities that we have to really characterize brain development. In this case, in this the example I'm going to give is all in adolescence, but it's because you have these extremely large data sets that are very diverse in their um, in in the makeup of the data sets. They're kind of crossed across the country. There's 10,000 individuals, so you can really, really dig into these type of questions. 
um, not perfectly because you don't measure everything. You only you only can examine what you measure. Um, but one of the one of the items that we're beginning to learn, and it's pretty profound. This, some of this work isn't quite out yet, but it will be out soon. Is that SES has a very large effect on. In fact, it soaks up a lot of the variance in what we in in our the relation the, the variance that we see in brain in brain development. Um, now, exactly what what Megan is describing um, that it's not the socioeconomics itself that's causing changes in the brain, but it's something that it's related to. And the the things that seems that it's most related to in our in the, in the hands of the data that collection from these, some of these large studies are things like sleep, um, which you might imagine, you know, the access to you know like books, you know. Um, there are things that are that are seems that it's related to items that you would that make kind of sense. It's not the SES per se, but they're the, it's the environmental relationships that are that seem to be driving a lot of those effects. But it has a much bigger effect on the brain and brain changes than we than we ever imagined, actually. Thank you. I agree that these large data sets are really telling us a lot and we're um starting to tease things out and 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 yet a lot of things go together like um whether a person lives in a city versus you know what kinds of environmental toxins they might have been exposed to and um structural racism and things like that so these are all super important questions that people are actively researching so thanks to both of you for speaking to them um, Damien, um, this is a little bit more by, by, back to basics. Could you just give a, a talk about or just speak about the basic functions of um, the different parts of the brain? So like, um, what are the different parts of the brain, like forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain? Yes, this was one of the questions. Okay, yeah. So, um, so, so I'm trying to figure out how to answer this with like it stays true to my belief about how the brain works, but also kind of does te talks about it in terms of how the textbooks do, right? So, okay. um, so like the back of the brain is typically, um, you know, is important for like your so the vision, visual experience. It's like the entry point, you know, for your eyes take in almost an unlimited amount of information. A lot of it is degraded and it goes from your retina to the middle of the brain, which is called your thalamus, all the way back to the back of your brain, which is the visual cortex. And then it flows forward into other parts of the brain that are important for integrating that information into actions, activity, language, which happen a little bit, a little bit further up. In the middle of the brain is like your motor, is like your motor cortex, which does a lot of motor actions. And in the front of your brain is your big frontal lobe, but what's one of the things that makes us Quite a bit different from other other species and that is where a lot of the at least the textbooks say a lot of the fun stuff happens the higher cognition big aspects of language things of that nature now the reality is and why i showed you all those squiggly lines and connections and all that kind of stuff is that the big frontal lobe is probably providing us with additional capacity to do more functions like we have more brain to do more stuff but it's not front of the brain that's doing the thing, right? It's really the entire system is working together to, to elucidate the functions. It's one of the, um, I would say neuroscience has, goes, has this, well, it's almost like a sine wave. It goes up and down, up and down from being like, the brain is very local. Every function is localized to one part of the, one part of the brain all the way down to it's one big mush of nothingness where everything does everything to very local. We're kind of on the downswing right now in our of of the from localization is to things that are more distributed across the brain these functions so there's certain kind of mathematical processes that occur in the front and the back um the cerebellum for example is really important for coordinating your activities which is kind of in the bottom back um but really the way it actually functions is by working together to provide language that's front back middle everywhere you know in fact some of the um um we're discovering things like things like adhd if you actually have enough data you can see that it's related to every part of the brain there's it doesn't look lo localized to anything you know which is completely new it's but it's only because we have these new 
techniques that are available for us in this in this respect. So uh, hopefully I I hope I hope I give a good answer. I was like trying to mix what I believe with what the textbooks tell us. And so we'll we'll see we'll see how that goes. That was actually really perfect, Damien. Thank you. That's why we have you here um, to to be able to help us bridge those. Um, Megan, could you could you please speak to? Um, there was a question: How does any sort of traumatic injury um, or other kinds of injuries impact gray matter development, and what kinds of things can happen as a result of injuries? Of injuries. Um... As in physical injury? Yeah, like maybe maybe like a concussion or something like this or oh. you know, kind of, um, or I guess for infants, it would more be like, um, you know, if, she, you know, getting shaken or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I think one of the things that's really remarkable about the first few years of life is that the brain does have this amazing capacity for change. And Damien really did demonstrate that nicely with um, the anecdote he shared with uh, the this the participant that had um, perinatal stroke. So, you know, the how an injury impacts the brain is going to depend on when in development this happens and the nature of that injury, right? So um, if in some sort of injury is, is really localized and early, there may not actually be um, a big noticeable change um, or impact on brain development. If it's um, really a substantial injury, so like a baby's in a significant car crash or something like that, where, you know, there's kind of traumatic injury, like, yeah, that has the potential to, to impact brain development negatively, just like it would if um, anyone else is involved in some sort of traumatic brain injury. Um, I'm by no means a neurosurgeon or a medical doctor. So, you know, and I think it's really hard to say like any sort of injury is going to have an, a, a consistent impact on the brain. Um, my sort of takeaway is always that the, the brain's capacity to, to adapt and change that the nature of that is different over time. Right. So in, in some ways, like infants are super adaptable, um, I, I will say there is sort of a related question in the chat sort of about um, maltreatment or sort of a negative environmental impact. And what we do know um, from a, 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 a really remarkable study called the Bucharest Early Intervention Study, this was a study of babies who um, were born in Romania who were grew up in an institution. And this was a point in time in the history of that country where these institutions did not have a lot of resources and there was not a lot of interaction or enrichment experience for these children. And um, in that study, they, they created a high quality foster care system. And then um, children, it was a randomized clinical trial. So children were either um, put into this high quality foster care or they stayed in the institution. And um, you may have sort of a reaction to hearing that that study existed and, you know, we don't have the time to kind of go into the ethics of that study um, here. But what I will say is that that is probably one of the best studies that can depict um, the impact of growing up in an, a, a severely impoverished environment um, and these children also suffered from malnutrition. So there were like huge impacts just on their growth, um, but they've continued to follow these children and at some point in time started scanning them. And they have shown that there are um, differences in both the structure and white matter, uh, sorry, both the, the function and white matter of these children. So they're, you know, even for the children that were not in the institution for as long, there are kind of long-term repercussions it's still even in a sort of controlled study like that hard to sort of say you know to pinpoint in the brain like the cause and effect right and and i think that's just due to the fact that um our brains are all unique which seems to be like the story that we keep coming back to right that like um brain development is dynamic and changes and it's different um, and also all of our brains are unique to us. So it's hard to say, it's not like a one-to-one, -one, like you experience this and that you're going to get an input, you're going to experience some sort of input, and then it's going to be a predictable um, outcome. Damien, anything to add? About... 
Oh, that was great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Megan. Um, this is uh, maybe a, one more a little uh, a, a, a bit on the theme of um, what we've been talking about, Damien. Um, the question has to do with OCD. Has there been MRI studies with in individuals with OCD, um, which it stands for obsessive compulsive disorder? And are those, if so, are those um, kind of findings also find? Are we finding out that they're individually unique, or are there kind of patterns across the population? There have been there has been a lot of work in that space. I would say um, the 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 individuals are definitely unique that is for sure um that that is what i can say for sure and actually ocd is there's a couple of um a couple of current indications of what you can use some of this neuromodulate neuromodulation stuff i was hinting at you know for actually treatments instead of actual drugs as therapeutics the ocd actually is one of them the problem i think for why this hasn't taken off, you know, and really done super well is be in partly because the the treatments for using these non-invasive techniques for neuromodulating the brain um, are are all based on the average brain, right? So you 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 essentially you kind of go in general on the average of where you think the neuromodul neuromodulation needs to go. And it was enough to get them through FDA approval for depression and OCD to get it. So it's actually a treatment that you can apply, but a lot of physicians aren't always using it because it doesn't work every time, you know, and a lot of times it's missed. And we think the reason why that is, is because everybody has their own spots of what the systems that are related, you know, and so it needs to be very much personalized. This is actually where this new techniques of using this new style of functional imaging is kind of taking off and kind of slowly seeping into the into practice because now we can show very specifically what makes you you and if i know there's a specific system in the brain that's related to ocd then i can identify that system in you and that's really really important to optimize the effectiveness of these treatments so hopefully that answers your question but that's that's really where 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 we're at with with things like OCD. Thank you. And I would just like to add that um actually OCD um research in the brain is an active um area of research for the University of Minnesota. We have some people in um, both adult psychiatry and in child psychiatry here at MIDB that are um studying um ways to understand OCD and um brain and study the brain and also brain modulation. So uh, neuromodulation. So thank you. Um, thank you for that question and that answer. Um, Megan, um, uh, what, so you showed some beautiful graphs about brain development in, um, in early life. And um, I think several people were noticing there were different lines and curves yeah. for boys versus girls and kind of just wondering about what's the, what's the theory behind that and what's kind of going on there. Yeah, um, I, I sort of glossed over that <laughs> maybe in, intentionally. So, um, and I, I, it's it's good to know that was a question that came up because I can dig into that a little bit deeper the next time I share that study. Um, so you probably noticed that it looked like the the line for girls and boys were separated, um, but there were dotted lines around there. And what those dotted lines tell us is that since they were overlapping, that the differences between brain volumes in boys and girls, and this would for most of these studies is sex assigned at birth. I'm just using uh, boys as, as girls as shorthand for that. Um, they, so like the, the, there's more overlap. So the groups are not different. So it's actually not the case that, um, boys have bigger brains than girls or vice versa. Um, there's, you know, maybe the, the lines are slightly apart, but, um, there's actually a, a just a, a lot of overlap in the brain data, right? So there's going to be a lot of girls that have bigger brains than boys and boys that have smaller brains than girls. So, uh, the figure in some ways is a little bit, um, it, it maybe leaves the, um, wrong impression unless you talk about those, um, confidence intervals. Thank you. And um, do you have thoughts on what might be driving like different, like average differences in the averages? Is it, you know, hormonal, yeah. is it genetic? Well, and I, I, um, 
uh, most studies, when they look at brain volume, they do some sort of correction for body size. But my my first instinct would just be to say that it could just be due to body sizes usually bigger in boys versus girls, um, especially as they get a little bit um, older. So that would be my first kind of instinct. If the studies had controlled for body size, which means that they sort of remove the variance and what we know is just, you know, if you have a bigger body, you have a bigger brain. Um then I, I, yeah, I don't think I have a, a good kind of speculation as to what could be driving that, again, non-significant difference in, in brain size. Thank you. Okay, great. All right, Damien, how has COVID affected the research with such an increase in stress on families and more families working remotely? Oh, that's a very good question. How has it affected the research? Um, well, I would say one of the things that's maybe it's kind of made things more difficult for like what you say for um, just like with the question alluded to about stress and being able to get into the get in and like a lot of the a lot of the other procedures, a lot of the other procedures that are required to make the experience easy. But at the same time, maybe it's helping us evolve a little bit. So we're doing a lot more work um, related to um, tele telework, doing things at home, building like materials so that people can can answer questionnaires and do things on the run. It's actually led to, um, you know, the environment inside of a, re a research center, right, is not always, no matter how hard we try, natural, right? So that you have very unnatural settings where you're, where you're trying to examine and do these experiments. So I think by kind of forcing us outside of what we could do in our in our general comfort zone, it's led to a lot of new mobile technologies and mobile sensing things where we can evaluate um, certain types of behaviors, moods, um, things of that nature in natural environments and get much more data of it. So um, I would say, on the one hand, I think COVID made research stressed the re research and made things made things for families much more difficult um in the traditional way um but then it also forced us to rethink how we're doing some of our research such that we now are doing some of the work in ways that are actually probably improved than the old than the old days so it's a, a little bit of give in the take that is perfect thank you and megan um question for you how do we nourish the brain how do the foods that we consume impact the function and development of the brain Gosh, another good question. Um, yeah, I mean, this is out of my area of expertise, and I don't think we probably have a lot of good research to show exactly how nutrition impacts brain development, especially in the first three years of life. I can't think of any studies um, there's a really interesting study happening right now called Baby's First Years that um, Minnesota is a data collection site for that project. And it particularly targeted families who were experiencing low income. And it was another randomized controlled trial that um, provided um, unconditional cash gifts to half of the participants in the study. Um, I think actually both groups got cash gifts. One, it was just a more significant amount and the other was a more trivial amount. And that study, I think, might have the potential to answer some of those questions because, um, you know, when families are experiencing low income and then provided with these unconditional cash gifts, um, they're able to, to provide food um, that maybe has more nutritional value than if um, they did not have that opportunity. Um, or they might, you know, a lot of um, families that are experiencing low income live in what we call food deserts, right? Where there's just not um, fresh produce available nearby. Um, so it's gonna be really interesting to see the results from that study and to, to, to learn more about this relationship between early nutrition and brain development. Um, I mean, I just have to say like, <laughs> My gut is my gut instinct is to say that, you know, eating a healthy diet is going to support brain development, like it supports just development of all of our other organs. But I, I can't think of any studies that have specifically targeted that question. 
Thank you so much. I would just maybe add, and maybe Damien, you might've been about to say this too. Um, Damien's co-director, Michael Jeff, has been for a long time, many, many years studying the impact of iron um, as an, as one aspect of nutrition, um, you know, so, and, and the, the, the negative impacts of, of having not enough iron early on in development on, on brain development. So that's been, that's, that's, that's one thing, but I, I wonder if maybe the person asking this question was kind of getting at more like the, the broad question that, or the topic you just mentioned, Megan, which is like the importance of the obvious importance of like a balanced diet, fresh fruits, fresh, fresh vegetables, um, a, a healthy diet on brain development. And I think that's probably like many, many things that we still don't know. I, I will say there's quite a bit of, of research, including here at the University of Minnesota on obesity and, and brain development and the mm -hmm. negative impacts of obesity, which, mm -hmm. you know, um, surprisingly, or not, maybe not surprisingly, but, um, um, paradoxically like occurs more in, in when, when people don't have access to, you know, mm -hmm you know, in food deserts and in, in, yeah. in context of poverty. So these are all super important and very thorny questions. You know, and I'll just add, I think this, one of my, one of the, one, I think probably one of the um, more important things to think about in our, in our society, like particularly the Western society about diets and brain developments relate to something that people don't typically think about and that's inflammation, you know, so it turns out that when we are on these Western style, high fatty diets, it can increase both during pregnancy and during early development, it increases the infl inflammation in your body. And that inflammation is very much related to early brain development because um, it turns out that when we, as when we developed both the neurons and a number of connections that kind of grow over time, stuff that Megan was talking about, the same cells that essentially protect us from infection, you know, in our in our body are the same ones that kind of clean up when we're pruning different connections or pruning old neurons are the same, they're the same cells. And so if you increase this inflammation, it kind of can mess up the milieu about how your brain develops over time related to those specific types of functions. So I think the a large outside of nutritional supplements like iron and zinc and things like that, which we, which have been related to various types of brain phenomena, the, the poor nutrition that we have in various types of diets can cause big changes in our immune system, which has consequently has lots of, lots of effects on our brain developmental trajectory. That's great. Thank you, Damien. Um, Megan, I have another question for you. Um, do you, see any marked difference in language development for children who have frequent ear infections when they are babies or toddlers? Oh, um, so we, um, yeah, there's, there's some idea that having recurrent ear infections can impact language development. Um, it's certainly not the case that like an ear infection here or there is going to, right? Um, we don't, uh, I mean, you can actually see an ear infection if you put a baby in a scanner <laughs> and see that it's kind of um, the fluids there. But mm -hmm. um, I think that there isn't super compelling evidence with the exception of the most extreme cases that it's going to have like a notable impact on language development. Um, but again, I think this is like, you know, um, there's so many good questions for us to ask um, using this technology that, you know, has really advanced a lot in the last 15 years. So, you know, I, I think that this conversation would look really different if we had it 10 years from now, because some of these studies, um, some of these questions that the audience is bringing up, we'd actually have the opportunity to, to answer. Um, but yeah, my, my, I think I would say that, you know, it, yeah, ear infections can kind of um, compromise language learning. Um, and so if children are having frequent ear infections, usually there's, you know, medical um, recommendations to address that. But, you know, the sort of 
run of the mill, you know, my kids certainly get ear infections here and there. Like that's not going to be enough to sort of um, derail um, this process of language learning in a meaningful way. Thank you. Um, here's a question I'm going to pose to both of you um, as our leading researchers. Um, what is one area you're hoping to learn or uncover through your research? Damien, how about you start? Um, What's that big breakthrough going to be? <laughs> I'm trying to think of, we do a lot of stuff. I have a big, I have a very big lab. So we do a lot of, <laughs> we do a lot of things, but um, I, you know, so I, you know, right now I was, if I would, let me just say, I, I think there's a lot of break potential breakthroughs, but the thing that I'm most excited about was pieces of what I, what I alluded to in both my answers and in my, in the, in the, in the talk, in the talk is that it feels great after working with non-invasive MRI for the last 20 years to finally have the capacity, the parameters, the exact know-how of how to make clinical impact with these techniques. And it all comes down to the theme of the day is that everybody's different, personalize these mappings, knowing what the targets are, and then using the new engineering and informatics, and computer science and deep learning and all this AI to be able to leverage that map, that information to target for as a non-medicinal therapeutic. I think that is, it's extremely exciting. Um, I, the example I oftentimes give is I can sit in a, um, I can, I can have, I can go buy the most expensive Lamborghini or Ferrari or fastest car ever. Right. And I need to, I, but if I don't have a map and how to get where I want to go, like to, you know, the capital or to Wisconsin or whatever, right then that that no matter how great that engineering is, you're still it takes you a long time because you're just going in the wrong direction. But now we have both the car and we have the map. And so the future is like extremely exciting and that's pretty much starting now. And Damien, just to follow up on that before I turn over to Megan, because another um, person asked if you could give an example of a treatment for mental health issue based on personal brain mapping. Are, so are, are we mainly thinking about like neuromodulation or what are what are you thinking about the future for these personal maps we can now create? Well, yeah, so they, there's a couple of, there's a couple of applications. One is for the personal mapping for neuromodulation and that comes in various forms. I don't know which car is going to win. It could be what we use, like what's called a TMS, which is magnets and neuromodulation. It could be we can use sound waves to modulate the brain non-invasively. Um, there are several different new, new techniques and new engineering toys that we don't know which ones win, but we all know they need a map. That's like the one thing, we know. But there's other cases too. So if you're trying to, one of the difficulties in developing new psychiatric drugs and, and um, new kind of medicinal therapies is that oftentimes to get the results, the outcomes, it takes many, many months, six months, seven months, eight months before you know whether your treatment's actually starting to work in an individual. And that is so expensive for these pharmaceutical companies that they didn't don't do it at all, right? So with these new image, with these kind of new kind of ways that we can do these maps, we can see immediately whether the drugs have an effect on the brain, and those types of outcomes reduce the time that you can as an outcome measure for efficacy. And then all of a sudden, you know, trying to try to find new types of ways and new therapies for, you know, disorders that are really affecting our societies are more um, more tenable to these companies who are, you know, trying to do some of these things and, and that are cheap that in a cheaper way. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And Megan, what are you hoping to learn or discover? Yeah, um, that is such a, a good question. And um, I was grateful for the time to reflect on my answer before I had to provide it. Um, so, you know, a lot of my research is aimed at informing very early um, treatments and supports for babies that go on to be autistic. Um, and we know that the autistic population is incredibly heterogeneous, right? So, um, you know, there are um, individuals that have wonderful, fulfilling lives, lots of them. 
um, who don't need any sort of treatment or support in their um, lives. The other side of that is there's somewhere between 30 and 50% of autistic school age kids that are minimally verbal or nonverbal. And not having sort of um, those adaptive skills to communicate your wants and desires and likes um, can be really limiting for, for that portion of the population. But the issue is that we don't know who's going to go on to be nonverbal until they're nonverbal, right? So what I would love is to be able to find a way to predict in infancy the children that are going to go on uh, to be minimally verbal or nonverbal so we can provide them with the appropriate supports to help um, bolster those language skills. Um, and I think that's especially important because um, I, you know, I, I, I came back to a few times during um, my, in my slides and in the Q&A, this idea that the brain has this incredible capacity to, to change um, in the first three years of life. So that means that intervention and treatment and supports during that time period has the potential to have a, a substantial impact on later development. So we really need to find a way to be able to um, predict these individual outcomes early in life so we can provide treatment and supports that are appropriate. It's this idea of like the right treatment for the right child at the right time. Um, so that is what I'm hoping we get to. That would be amazing. <laughs> yes, thank you. And I, I think, you know, the, the whole community is behind you on again. So thank you for dedicating your research to these, both both of you for your research um, in these really important topics, which are so critical at this time, especially, I think. Um, uh, it's 628, so I'm going to um, go ahead and begin to just thank both of you, um, Dr. Fair, Dr. Swanson, for being panelists. Thank you for your time sharing your insights um, into the remarkable capabilities of the brain from its intri intricate neural networks to the role of neuroplasticity in shaping our cognitive experiences. We also want to thank you, our audience, our participants in the Mini Medical School for joining today. So we will see you next week for the second mini medical school session on mental health, which will be at the same time next Wednesday. We have an amazing group of experts next week that will who will discuss conditions such as ADHD, autism, depression, and more. Thank you.